What's going on fam? Raif Darazi here. It is officially Pride Month and with that being said I want to talk about the latest social climate when it comes to LGBTQ plus issues. I in the past few weeks I've been called mentally ill, groomer, pedophile more times than in all the rest of my life combined. It's there's something wild going on right now. And it's a narrative that's really being pushed heavily that anything essentially related to LGBTQ plus is related to pedophilia, grooming, you know, indoctrination of kids and mental illness and basically discounting and invalidating the, the our entire community. <laughs> um, you know, it, it started out as specifically trans issues and then trans as it relates to kids and sports and then it's from there it it's, it's a slippery slope and the reason why it's a slippery slope is because it was never about that in the first place it's always a bit been about not understanding our community and hating our community and wanting to discriminate but needing to start from somewhere and it and throughout history this call to protect the children to save the children has always been a very thinly veiled excuse to discriminate and to inflict civil rights abuses that has time and time again whether it's been with hiv whether it's been with um you know interracial marriage it's a time-honored tradition in using kids to justify your hatred and your discrimination and i you know i posted recently that there are close to, if not more than at this point, I don't know, um, 500 anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced into state legislatures in the US um, this year alone, which is already more than double that of 2022. And it's, it's just continuing. There's no slowing down. There's no stopping it. And things like, you know, anti-trans bills, don't say gay or anything else in schools, uh, bathroom issues, conversion therapy being unbanned things like that and oh and hospitals that are you know christian or, or catholic um having the right to deny patients who they don't want to help um and all of this all of this is being driven by the narrative that we are trying to protect children and we're trying to save kids and i would argue that especially when it comes to education in schools that having lgbtq plus education visibility awareness is actually what saves kids and children it's that is the answer not erasing us from school life and, and sure you can make the argument that oh well you know that's not a place for for in schools sexuality especially at that age it doesn't need to be taught by schools. They can learn that at home. They can get it from parents, whatever. But the reality is that's where kids spend most of their time as they're growing up. That is where they learn a formal education. The alternative, whatever your parents deem fit, well, eventually that kid is going to grow up to an age where they start to learn, figure things out for themselves, not based on what their parents wanted to teach them. I mean, that's the real indoctrination is what your parents instill in you. But by then it's too late. As a child, for me, growing up gay, not really having a chance to explore that on my own until I'm 18 years old is, or having a chance to learn it in school until I'm 18 years old, it, that's way too late for me. It was way too late for me. And I didn't have that exposure outside of school and the kind of education that you're going to get outside of school is going to be i don't know it's that's the thing we don't know because it's kids are exposed to social media kids are exposed to tv and and cartoons and and what they learn from their peers and exchange that way but to not have a formal education a scientifically founded based education that's that's a real travesty i mean 
look at what happens with sex ed when sex ed is taken out of schools and then and then kids have to try to figure out how sex works and what their body is doing and and what menstruation is on their own and they don't and their parents are too uncomfortable to talk to them about it so they just kind of like hear myths and stories from kids and then they don't really understand how it all actually works it's and then it becomes this mess but when you have a formalized education backed by science that is standardized and taught across school systems that's the best chances for success and so i just want to talk about my own experience growing up gay and and i and i want to do that because what these folks these extremists who are having a profound impact on i would say middle mainstream america the um the non-extremists, if you will, the people in the middle who kind of just want to like live their lives and aren't like hate filled and trying to like pass all these anti-discrimination laws are still impacted by hearing and witnessing the arguments from both sides. And, a, and there's a lot of like rhetoric in the media. There's a lot of stories that are untrue or they're blown out of proportion, etc. And so people in the middle kind of go, mm, well, they have a good point. That kind of make that makes sense. So, yeah, maybe I agree with that. Um, what all of these bills are doing in this discrimination and anti-LGBTQ plus is taking us to a time that we've already been through. We've already been there. We've already done that. I've already lived it. And I can tell you that that, that was not the answer. That was not what was healthy. In fact, it was it, that was traumatic. That is what fucked me up as a kid. That is what made my childhood in so many ways unbearable um, to the point of, you know, getting to the point where I'm 16 years old and I'm ODing on pills because I have so much despair inside and hate for myself and a lack of self-esteem. And then, you know, it just compounds from there. When I grew up, being gay was definitely not taught in school at all. It wasn't mentioned. It wasn't mentioned in sex ed. I had no idea. The only frame of reference that I had to the notion of being gay was, um, I, I remember one of the first times I like saw something and I felt different, but I didn't know what it was and I didn't know how to put it into words was like seeing like an advertisement in a magazine. I, re I remember it was a Marlboro ad and there was a, um, like a cowboy on a horse and it, he was like smoking a cigarette or something like that. And there, I remember thinking there was something about that guy that made me feel something and it was a good feeling, but I didn't know what it was or how to put it into words. And then, you know, just seeing like pictures in National Geographic of like naked, naked people and then being more interested in looking at the naked men than I was in looking at the naked women. Um, also didn't explain it couldn't explain that. And I remember the first time the concept of homosexuality that popped into my head was in junior high. And I remember, you know, jokingly guys talking about like anal and like putting your thing in someone's poopy butt. And it, to me, it was like, what? Like, that doesn't even make sense. Why would you do that? I don't get it that's gross and it's dirty and that's all that I could associate with that. And then on top of that, being called a fag, faggot or gay was attributed to that thing. And people were saying that to me. People were saying that to me since I was, I don't know, in like fifth grade, calling me gay and faggot and blah, blah, blah. And like, I didn't have any connection with what I learned was the definition of being gay and what my experience was. So I legitimately was like, I'm not gay. Like that's, I'm not, that's not who I am. But then in the same instance, I would have these, you know, um, rare moments where I would like have this weird little like butterflies feeling experience. Like I remember when I was at home one time and um, the neighbors like right next to me, our house, they were, they were like in their, in their teens, to late teens I would say and I just thought they were so cool and I was maybe I don't know 10 11 12 it's hard to remember and 
I remember one of the guys I was like was really really attractive and so but in my head it was like he is so cool like he is so cool and I just want to be around him and I want to be his friend that's that's how I kind of like made sense of that feeling inside and I remember him like I was like kind of like oh one of the girls was really cute so I was like saying oh and I was kind of like oh like being all like giddy like oh she's really pretty and it was his girlfriend and then uh and he he thought it was like cute and funny so he like came over to me and i remember he was like whispering something in my ear and i could smell his cologne and like i just smelled his cologne and like i just had this rush and this feeling again but anytime something like that would come up immediately i was like if i start when i started to think about it in a sexual or a romantic way it was it was like repress that no 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 that's not okay that's not good we don't want that girls are good and um and so i was like in extreme denial i would not allow that to to be a part of me even though it it invariably was so i'm being bullied since fifth grade relentlessly like every single day constantly on the other hand i've got these feelings and these thoughts that I keep trying to push away and I'm telling myself it's, it's just everybody experiences that a little bit and it's a phase and it's going to go away and don't worry about it. Just focus on girls um, and just focus on myself and whatever. These people don't know what they're talking about. They're just being bullies. And then at the same time, there's there at that point, there really wasn't anything in media that I could like learn from. There wasn't like popular shows, you know, there wasn't like will and grace and and (laughs) things like that they're really just normalized it and made it seem like every day you know if it did show up in the media it was like extreme it was like this is not you know just friends having an encounter on a tv show and going through silly scenarios it was like major aids you know like the one time that i was aware that a gay guy came over to our house he was my my stepdad at the times um I guess friend or something and 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 showed up to the house and uh he did he looked kind of like sickly and pale and thin and i remember my stepdad telling me like don't don't hug him don't touch him and um and then and then that was the last i ever saw of him and i assume that he's dead and i assume that he died of aids uh and that was you know the subtext of that <laughs> being instilled in who i I'm trying not to be is like that's intense and so then I go and then and then I go into high school and then this is where hormones really kick off you know I'm really starting to develop into a sexual being and sex ed there's no there's no education for sex ed and anything remotely hints at anything that's gay is like laughed at and is just a joke right so (laughs) that's not helpful either and I remember being in high school and and just like really starting to learn really serious things, especially in history class, about the world, about humanity, about people. And I just remember being so disappointed and so like sad um, that the people just were not who I felt like I am on the inside. I assumed that everyone else was the same way inside and has a really big heart inside and cares. I assumed that everyone was that way. And if they weren't expressing it in the moment, it's because they were going through something and they just needed a little, like a little nudge, a little comfort, a little help, something. That naive kind of sense that the world is just, just a hug away from being extremely good. (laughs) When in fact, it's, a it's, it's way deeper than that, clearly, as you know, most of us are aware at this point. Yeah, do I think that all humanity is innately good? Yes, but I don't think that it's that simple or that easy either. And so that that facade that I created for myself, and I'm sure part of that was a coping mecha- mechanism in order to deal with all this crap that I had been dealing with for so long, came crumbling down. I could no longer hold that up for myself this disney experience of life it just wasn't real and that realization you know that took me way down um i became a punk i became a rebel i was like 
I had like anarchy signs on my clothing. I was doing that whole thing and experimenting with drugs and anything I could to cope and to look for people who could relate to me and that they also had that same just um, collapse of their um, view of the world and that pain, that, that trauma. And I found that group and, and together we, you know, we just um, encouraged each other to keep feeling and being the way that we were. So, and that was destructive. And it got to the point where eventually I was so depressed consistently all the time on a daily basis. I couldn't bear to continue to be depressed like that. It was so like, what is the point of living life if that is how you are going to feel all the time? What is the point? You know, other people have, I feel like when I watch movies and stuff sometimes, like these people who will go through hell and high water and do anything and everything just to live, I'm like, kudos to you, but I am not that person. Like there is a point with which I question the purpose and the value of living. Like to me, living is not the end all be all. <laughs> like, especially if you believe in an afterlife, it's like, okay, life is just just a chapter. Like it's not, it. I don't need to live if I'm gonna be, you know, like in a cave with, you know, eating, eating shoe leather and drinking water every day for 30 years. Like that is not, to me, worth living. So, and, and I'm a little bit more philosophical about life. So going into depression with that kind of mindset, I eventually was like, I don't wanna do this anymore. I can't do this. I didn't wanna die, but I also didn't know how to help myself. And there was no one who could help me. It, it seemed like no one was helping me, including my parents. They didn't know how, and I was just at a loss. So like, I'm like, well, I'm gonna OD on all these pills. And if I die, then that's it. And if I survive, well then maybe, maybe that will wake someone up enough to like do something, help me, I need help. I can't figure it out on my own. I'm 15, 16 years old. And uh, clearly I survived. And um, I went to a mental hospital for a week until I was deemed um, not a danger to my own health. Um, and that helped. I. After that, I um, I was like, okay, you know, I I gotta I gotta change something. I can't keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I really loved the idea of acting and being in the drama club, so I joined the drama club, and I really, really, really loved it instantly. And it was so time consuming to be part of that drama club that I had to make a choice between doing drama in high school or hanging out with this group of friends. And the group hanging out with the group of friends, well fun and made me felt like I belong and other people understood me, um, it was really, it led me down a really destructive path. So it kind of made sense for me to, to just pursue acting. And I made friends with all these people. Amazing. Like in, in our drama club in high school, it had, you had football players, you had cheerleaders, you know, you had nerds, you had, you had creatives, you had all types. We were all friendly. And we all got along for the most part. And so that was amazing to be part of this group doing something that I loved that was super productive and that made me happy. And while in the drama club, you know, it came to light that a lot of my friends that I had made went to church every week. And so I, start, I started going to church too. And I was like, wow, you know, this is another layer of like self-help here because, excuse me, what I was learning in church made so much sense. Self-love, loving others, um, you know, having this connection with, with a higher God with a higher purpose, having a purpose on earth, you know, all the tenets that it teaches you about how to live, like basically as an essentially a good person. Those were all things that I valued from the get go. And here was a place where everyone was coming together to um, support the same ideology. And it was great. And there was there was a, a band that played every week and it was and we did worship and that worship was like meditation for me and it was like therapy and it was catharsis. You know, I could um connect with people in through music and that was that was really really awesome too there was so many amazing things i made so many friends in church i found 
mentors, in one of the pastors, in in an elder in the church who I greatly looked up to. And so things were going great for a while until, you know, I had to come to terms with being gay. And that didn't really happen until I fell in love with my best friend. Um, and again, there was no language there. There was no education there. You know, there was definitely exchanges between us about like, you know, if I was gay, or, uh, no, if I, sorry, he said, you know, if he broke up with his girlfriend, he would turn gay for me, like out of the blue, out of, for no reason whatsoever. Like we were just close like that. And I, and I didn't think it was weird. And I, I actually was really heartened by it and it felt nice to be connected to somebody like that. And, um, but when I eventually, you know, just was direct with him and I said, Hey, you know, I think I have feelings for you. And I think, you know, I have feelings for you. And, um, I said, but I'm, I'm, I am i am not expecting anything either way. I just wanted to like talk to you about it and, and hear what you had to say. And it was like, it was like what he, he flipped switch 180. I don't know what you're talking about. I never said any of those things, you know, you know, like don't message me anymore. Don't talk to me anymore. And it was like my best friend one day just became someone who would no longer even talk to me anymore after that. And just instantly we all had the same circle of friends in drama, in church, etc. And suddenly, whoa. So, and I kind of like just kept to myself for a while. Cause I was like, holy shit, that went really, really bad. And, um, he ended up outing me to all my friends and so they all knew before I even had a chance to tell them which I eventually did and they they were like well we already know and he of course spun the story so that I just made everything up and I'm the crazy one and at that point again I'm self-hating I'm suppressing my homosexuality any experience that I've had with being gay has been negative none of it has been through school or proper education or um, having visibility in media or support from corporations like we have today at all, nothing. Um, and then at that point, I turned to my church. I turned to the people that I look up to, my mentors, my you know advisors, the pastor that I was connected with. And my mentor said, you're not, you're, you weren't born as gay. It's okay. You're not going to go to hell. And you don't have to continuously be gay either. You can change. So that was like, okay, okay. There's there's like a ray of hope, a ray of sunshine. I can still have everything that I've, I've gained since I tried to commit suicide and still live my life. And at that point, I told my parents because I was like, okay, I have a plan now. So I can, I can let them know that I'm gay um, and, and also have a solution for them because... Growing up, I didn't believe that they were of the mindset that it was okay to be gay. Did they say hateful, anti-gay things? No, but I just knew, I just knew it's the unsaid things that made me believe that they did not want a gay son. So I sat them down and I said, I'm gay, but don't worry because I am going through this thing with church, I didn't have I didn't have the words for it at the time, but I'm going to be meeting with my pastor once a week and I'm going to be doing therapy and I'm going to be going to this group once a week as well. And I'm going to take care of it and I'm going to be straight. And so they were like, OK, yeah, we support you. Great. That's 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 a great plan. We're here for you if you need anything. And I was like, OK, cool. Do you know what that was? <laughs> what that's called it's called conversion therapy i had no idea that's what i was doing but that's obviously what i was doing i was meeting with my pastor once a week one-on-one -on -one, to talk about my homosexual feelings to eradicate anything in my life that could lead me to the temptation of being gay i had to read certain scriptures in the bible certain passages i had to refrain from masturbation from looking at any type of porn because all those things were Temptations that could lead me down the wrong path. In addition to meeting with him once a week and telling him all my deep, dark secrets and crying and confessing to him what I was going through. Um, the, and then, and then at, the, at the same time, there was this guy that I met on a school trip that 
I had this connection with and he had a connection with me and it was amazing. It was my first time I actually like reciprocated the feeling of like love with another guy. And I had, I had, I told him I can't be with, I can't like talk to you anymore. I can't like consider you in that way anymore. Like we have to end it. We have to break it off. Blah, blah, blah. I broke my own heart. I broke his heart. And that was to please my pastor in the hopes that I was going to be straight. In addition to that, I was going once a week to a sex addicts group therapy at the church. A bunch of other Christian guys who were sex addicts. Some of them were um, legitimately addicted to sex and pornography and like and had cheated on their spouses, what have you. And then I think there was at least one other guy who was a little older, older than me, probably in his early to mid 20s, who was also gay and trying to be straight. And I remember being attracted to him um, and I I wanted to like reach out and talk to him and connect with him. But I was like, no, that's exactly what the devil would want me to do in this situation. And I'm here to be straight. So, And I went through that for about six or so months until I was starting to get so depressed again that I uh, was starting to think about suicide again and told my stepdad. And my stepdad finally said, you know, if it's making you feel this way, then maybe you should stop. And I said, okay. And so I did. And I told my pastor that, the one that I was going into conversion therapy with. And he said, well, you have to know that if you decide to stop conversion therapy, then that means that you're willfully living in sin. And if you're willfully living in sin, well, then you can't be a leader in the church. You can't be in a leadership role. And doing theater in the church, which I had been doing a lot of shows, a lot of plays, I could, he said I couldn't do it anymore. There was this thing that I loved, that I found, that I had passion for in a community that I loved with new friends and, and that I considered family and that represented everything that I aspired to be. And he said, if you want to be gay, then all that gets taken away. And I was like, Chad, the pastor, I was like, I can't like, I, I'm feeling suicidal. I, it's not, I don't have a, like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And so he's like, okay, well then, you know, it is what it is. And I, I, you know, my Christian friends didn't understand and they didn't support me. And while I was doing this theater in the church, I had also started doing theater at the local private Christian university known as Vanguard University. It's in Costa Mesa, California. And the head of the theater department loved me. She wanted me to go there. She wanted me to attend when I was ready to go to college. Um, Because I had taken a break right after high school to go to like community college. So she's like, we want, we would love for you to transfer in and immediately join the theater department. We need guys to be in theater here. And I had done, even though I wasn't a student, I had done several shows at the university with, and I had developed, you know, friendships with the theater department and the other students. I was so excited and in order to get into a private Christian university, you need to have a pastoral reference, aka a a letter of recommendation from a pastor, from someone at the church of authority who can vouch and say that you are someone who is, you know, living a Christian lifestyle and therefore, you know, is should be able to go to this school. And my pastor also made it very clear that he w- would have to put in the reference letter that I was willfully living in sin. And that part of the letter, forget everything else I had done, was doing, forget everything else about who I am as a person. None of that mattered except for that one part of the letter that said I was willfully living in sin. And that meant that my application to the university was denied. I could no longer go there. And that was it. I I mean, that's essentially what you would call excommunication. I got kicked out of the church. I lost all of my friends and my Christian family. I couldn't do theater anymore. I couldn't do the thing that I loved. I couldn't go and, and, and worship with, with my fellow Christians. I tried to go to the church and, and just try to like attend the services, but it was like, the pastor was talking about anti-gay stuff. I had to, I had to stand up and walk out. Like I couldn't, 
I couldn't go to a place that shunned who I am, my very existence. But I know this is a long story and I know this is a long vlog, but this is just to show you like my experience from being a little kid to graduating high school and going to college was exactly what these anti-LGBTQ plus bills that are being proposed all over the US are, are striving for. They want to take out who we are out of education, out of sex ed, out of regular education. They don't want kids to have exposure to the gay community at all whatsoever via stories, via books. Be the argument is because sexuality has no place at that age. Well, it's like, okay, straight. Well, then being heterosexual is also sexuality. So, th so there should be no heterosexual couples in stories either. Like you shouldn't have a mom and dad because in a story because that's heterosexual and that's sex and that's indoctrination so that has no place just like having a story about two dads or two moms is sexual and has no place right i mean using that same logic you you wouldn't be able to have straight families or a story about a man and a woman or a boy and a girl either but we all know it's not really about that it's not about Oh, they don't need to be exposed to sex because it, being gay is not about sex. It's about it's about who I am and who I'm attracted to and meant to spend my life with. And which goes way more than sex. It's about love, it's about intimacy, it's about connecting with another human, it's about understanding who I am in relation to another person and how I fit in the world. That's what it's about. Who am I in the world? Not what part of my body, you know, interacts with another part of somebody of somebody else's body. That's that's so insignificant in the conversation of things. But here's the thing: when when you take all of this stuff out, and you when you deny someone's existence, when you take all this stuff out, when you remove the education, when you remove the visibility, the exposure, when you cause someone to have their self-esteem to be crushed, their self-identity to be buried because of shame, because of self-hatred, and because of that stigma that is suddenly present because it's not okay, you get bullied more and more and more, which can lead to things like depression and suicidal ideation. You can lose friends and family, get kicked out of your home, get kicked out of church, get kicked out of doing the things that you love. For who you are. When that happens, that shit fucks you up. That shit is traumatic. It stays with you for a long time. In your formative developing years, the most crucial part of your life, when you are developing your brain, your emotional responses, how you cope with anxiety, how you deal with things, in that time, you are put through the fucking ringer. Of course you're going to have issues. Of course it's you're going to you're going to express things in really weird unhealthy ways. But what happens is when we become adults, myself, when I became an adult, I did not know how to deal. I did not know how to find a healthy relationship. I did not know how to have healthy sexual relationships. I didn't know how to determine who was good for me as a person in general. I didn't have self-esteem. I was lacking in confidence. Other people express it in different ways. They become cynical. They become drug users. You know, alcoholic. You might become cynical. You might lash out, be angry. There are so many things, ways that a person can express that kind of trauma. Not knowing life in any other way. Because that's that's... That's their experience of life. You have to be taught how to be a healthy, strong, confident person. And if you're not taught those things, you won't be. And the sick irony, the sick twist is that these people who make this argument against LGBTQ plus say, look at them. Look at the way they behave. That proves that 
they that being LGBTQ plus is a mental illness because I never was taught to love myself properly because I was never taught what it means to be gay to deal with this trauma to deal with because I was bullied because I was kicked out of the church because I was became suicidal and, 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 and kind of was a mess as a young adult because I was a mess that's all because I they're, they're communicating that I, I'm a mess as a young adult because I'm gay not because of what I went through because of everybody out there treating me a certain way it's my fault it's my fault because of the way I was born that's why I'm fucked up not because of the school system, because of religion, because of society. Do you see how that's really messed up? But that's the argument that's made, is that these people are sick and twisted. Look at the way that they behave. That proves it. Anyway, that's my rant. I know this was a long one. I just really had to, like, I was just really feeling really melancholy today. I was feeling really sad. Um, just kind of going through it. Um, I don't know. I just have days like that where I'm melancholy. I'm probably tired and I'm probably sore from working out a lot because I've been going to the gym lately a lot. And um, it drains my energy and it also kind of will take me to darker places and things, you know, bubble up that, I've been going through lately and, and, and stuff like that so but nevertheless I felt like it was something that's worth talking about especially now that we're in in pride in pride month and look around like all the stuff that's happening with all this cancel culture it's ironic because cancel culture is supposedly just for woke people but cancel culture is like everybody <laughs> cancel culture has always been here it's called boycotts it's just we're giving it a different name now and and saying oh well it's woke people ah, cancel culture woke people it's like no everybody does it everybody decides oh i don't like what that corporation is doing so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna um patronize them i'm not gonna go buy their products and that will teach them they're gonna lose customers okay that's fine i don't have a problem with that everybody can do that but the amount of hate and vitriol that's coming forth like these target videos of people going to target and just like man just going off on the employees as if the employee has like any say in what is being displayed in the stores they're they're just trying to do their they're just trying to work like if you're going to give someone a hard time go to the ceo go to the boards of these companies go to the decision makers but the reality is it's not about that it's just about social media is just about making a punchy video getting some clout but it's so hate-filled it's so angry and it's so alienating and destructive um like and, and 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 a lot of it's like manipulated like this tucking bathing suit for, people were saying the in the kids section they have this bathing suit for kids for tucking and then i, I read an article of ap news came out and said no it was only for adults there was no like kids tucking bathing suit so i'm like but you, can you imagine just like being an average person an average adult you don't follow lgbtq stuff you don't really know many gay people or have that many interactions you're just kind of like you're living your life you got your family you got your kids whatever you don't really care and then along comes this video saying, saying can you believe there is this bathing suit for kids so that they can tuck their genitals in and, and be trans at like six years old. Can you believe that? And then in your mind, you're like, wow, that's kind of crazy that a parent is doing that, you know, for a kid who is six years old and doesn't really know anything yet. And we can have all kinds of discussions and arguments about whether it's okay or not at the end of the day. But the point is stuff's being skewed. There's so much hate and discrimination out there. And it's like not legit information a lot. It's um so what what next i don't want to end this on like a terrible note terribly negative um i just think that you know there was a time where we all kind of got a little bit complacent with our rights and you know i've always kind of known it's fragile we can't take our rights for granted etc 
But, you know, I'm of the mindset that once we reach critical mass where most people are level-headed and support something, we're always going to have a certain amount of people who are extremists, radicals, conspiracy theory, whatever you want to call it, in the minority, that's, it's whatever. But once I see like a critical mass of people who are generally level-headed and, and, and support things the right way, in a humanitarian way, then I kind of ease up and I go, okay, it's, it, we've got some good momentum. I don't need to fixate on it quite so much. But the fact that I'm making this video is the result of the fact that I'm seeing a very big change in the discourse nationwide, generally speaking, and that it's getting a little scary and a little out of control and that I feel the need to speak up again this Pride Month. I, I sincerely hope that Pride Month goes by without incident. Um, I'm not entirely hopeful of that, but um, I really, really pray that we can just celebrate <laughs> our community in peace and get back to, we all just want to live our lives, right? We all just want to go about our lives, be happy, um, and that's it. So I don't really know what else to say. I know I'm leaving it on a weird note, but I just needed to get all that out and share that. I know that, I hope that it is helpful in some way to some of you who are watching this to know that, you know, you're not alone. And, and, for people who have been through it with me and, and understand what that was like growing up in that way. During a, a time when it was also really, um, really kind of um, volatile because at that time, that's when gay marriage was like being proposed in civil unions and domestic partnerships. And that was like huge and it was exploding everywhere. And it was such a big deal. And it was, it kind of felt the same way as it feels now. It was like so like, blown out of proportion and they were saying you know the next thing is going to be bestiality people are going to be marrying animals and and it's just a slippery slope from here and it's satan and it's just going to destroy our country it's going to destroy the fabric of existence basically it was like so crazy out of proportion and then like look where we are like what what did gay marriage destroy you know and it's that same ideology is happening now so, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to be thinking about it more and seeing if there's other content that I can, I can touch on. And at least maybe, maybe even if it's just news and kind of touch on new headlines so that people are at least aware of what's going on. Okay. Thank you so much for, uh, sitting through this with me. I hope it wasn't too boring or too left field for you. And, um, please let me know in the comments, everything you think. Any questions that you might have, stuff that you'd like me to cover, whatever, the usual. Communicate with me. Let me know you're out there. I always appreciate it, and I will see you all soon. Cheers.